just like Martin Luther and many other reformers, um, our conscience should be captive to the word of God in all matters of our life. God's word should reign supreme, bottom line. Um, so with all that being said, um, Sister Nephi, we pray that um, God's word is seen and it's evident as you present on this um, relevant topic as we just got out of um, the month of Black history, but Black history is all year round. It doesn't stop in just February. Um, so now I give the floor over to you or the screen over to you um, and you can begin giving us a word. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for the prayer, the opening prayer, and all those kind words you said to me. That was really nice, sis. Thank you. Um, I am open to discussing that experience with the excommunication because it legit felt like Martin Luther. Like, it was, like, it was intense. Um, so this evening, I um, have prepared a message about being Christian, Black, woke, and SDA, which my motto has always been Christian, Black, woke for the past about five years. But now I am like publicly, very publicly SDA. So especially since I'm talking to you guys, I think um, the message should be tailored to our particular experience. So I'm, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. And I can't see anybody while this is going. I can't even see myself. So if you guys need me to stop or have a question or anything like that, just feel free to interrupt me because there's no other way for me to know. Will do. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so who am I? Um, on Facebook is my primary platform for social media. This used to be my banner. I've kind of updated it a little bit. Um, but what I do is urban apologetics. And for those of you who don't know what that is, apologetics is defending something. So um, I defend Christianity in the urban context. I answer questions related to being one of these three categories or especially where they intertwine. So I answer questions related to being a black Christian. And I find that African-American or Afro-descended um, Christians deal with a particular line of questioning that doesn't necessarily apply in other spaces. So we get questions about slavery and we get questions about, you know, African spirituality and whether these things are compatible with our faith. And so my main areas of focus have been um, Hebrew Israelite doctrine, um, African, uh, African American slavery, specifically American, and uh, African spirituality um, and Egyptology. So people call them hoteps, the people who study Kemet or Egypt. Um, a little bit about myself, I was raised Catholic by my Afro-Cuban mother, um, but she was also into Ifa, which we call here in the United States, Yoruba. It's basically, um, it, it has different names depending on which island you're from in the Caribbean. Um, you may know it, it's like a variant of Santeria or Vodun, um, Candomblé. They're basically worship systems where they worship different deities. So I was raised both Catholic and in that kind of space. Um, but as a child, I always had like this nagging feeling about worshiping other gods and, the, you know, because they took me to mass is what they call it in the Catholic church. They took me to mass in Sunday school and I read in the commandments where we should have no other gods. But yet during the week, we were wilding out with these other gods, right? So, so I had that conflict internally. Um, and at a very young age, I mentioned it to my mother. She allowed me to stop going um, to those meetings, but I was still Catholic up until um, high school. And an, another nagging feeling that I had was dealing with the Sabbath. Um, reading the commandment were clearly said the seventh day of the week, and yet we went to church on the first day of the week. Um, and it wasn't until I got to high school that I had these questions answered. That was the first time um, I ever heard of Seventh-day Adventism, was reading a book in my history class. I went to a regular secular high school. Um, we were reading Gifted Hands by Ben Carson. And it mentioned that he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And that's my first hearing of it. So then I went through this phase where I kind of like, okay, I have to tell this part. So in that same history class, I went to, one day I went to spit a piece of gum into the garbage can and it made a funny sound. 
So I went to see what it was. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was a magazine. So I pulled out the magazine and had like a picture of a Pope with a Pope on it. And then, you know, I'm reading through it and there's all this imagery with beasts and dragons and revelation. And it was just like, it was really intense. But one part caught my attention where it said that there were two different sets of the Ten Commandments. So there was the Catholic version and then the version that was found in the Bible. So I haven't been raised Catholic. I recognized what they call the Catholic version. So then I went to research to find whether it was, you know, accurate in terms of what was in the Bible and it wasn't. And that really, really upset me because I just I have a passion for both history and truth. And I started feeling like I was like being bamboozled. So that kind of started my journey away from Christianity altogether. Um, I left. I, I started reading books by really Afrocentric authors. I bought into this theory about Jesus being a myth stolen from some other deity and that they made him up and all these other things we're going to explore a little bit of tonight. Um, but thankfully, obviously, God brought me back. He, he gave me some good sense that only can come from him. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and so I'm here today. I was baptized in 2007. Um, I and my husband, we now have five babies. Um, and my the majority of my time is spent in either just, you know, urban apologetics or just apologetics generally. So this has been my mission statement to help you feel secure in your Christianity while being Black, because yes, you can be a Christian and be Black, right? Meaning you have to compromise because of some issues regarding slavery or this, that, and third. And then to help you feel secure in your Blackness while being Christian. Because for some odd reason, I, I've only found this when it comes to being Black. And <laughs> the issue is, for some reason, it appears as though Blackness is at odds with Christianity. Like, you're not even supposed to consider yourself Black. But we, don't, we don't tell that to other cultures. We don't tell that to other races or, or anything like that. We, we specifically have that message for African-Americans. And I take issue with it. So that's been my mission statement. It's under review or under like undergoing construction because now I feel like I want to incorporate more blatantly the Fairy Angels message as a result of the things that I went through last October. Um, this was also one of my uh, profile pictures. I ain't like them Christians you're used to because society has this view of Christians that like, we don't know what we believe for real. Well, you know, that's not true of Adventists because Adventists, we know the study, right? We like, we in the book, right? But Christians in general um, have this reputation for just being a Christian out of tradition and not really having a firm foundation for their belief or why they believe what they believe or even understanding what the doctrines are, right? Like we just have a confusion about the Bible. That's the reputation. And so part of my effort is to make sure that that's not true of people that I come in contact with. Like, let's study this thing out. Let's talk about it. Let's investigate uh, and see what the Lord has to say. Another area that I find passion for is archaeology. So I, I do like biblical archaeology. It's been a while since I posted it on Facebook, but it's something that I have a passion for, just showing certain um, people that existed and, and in the places where they said they were, where the Bible says they were, um, and, um, you know, things of that nature, events as well. Um, one good one to look up is Jericho. Uh, that was one of the ones that blew me away. It's not a part of the presentation, but since I mentioned it, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, look up Jericho. They found Jericho. They found the walls, like, you know, crumbled, like the Bible says. There are certain pieces of evidence that suggest that it was during the season of the year that the Bible said it happened when the walls collapsed. Um, there were They found people within their homes, or um, they also found, like, grain storage, to suggest that the people didn't necessarily have time to flee, that there was a sudden um, catastrophe. And so we look at that and we say, well, clearly that's supporting the Bible, um, the Bible's account. But secular minds look at that and say, oh, there was an earthquake, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it was an earthquake, earthquake because God made the walls fall. But anyway, so this, this is um, just a little taste of some of the things that you will see online. Um, and I talk mainly about the internet because I've spent a lot of my energy there. But I also talk to people in person. But I can't show you a screenshot of me talking to somebody in person. So Christianity is and has always been under attack. This, birth, this brother here, his name, he calls himself Amun-Ra Aten, which is in reference to an Egyptian deity. And so he would be what we call a hotep, although now they're pretending, or not pretending, but now people are saying that term is offensive. But that's just what they're known by. Um, 
And so they have a particular hatred for Christianity. They have a particular hatred for Jesus. Um, this was under my the, the first picture that I showed you, the Christian black woke with the, with the flag. Um, this was a conversation under that. And he says, the truth is out there, but not in this book. And that's really indicative of how they think generally. Like they'll make certain claims. People will make certain claims um, and certain arguments or whatever, but they don't necessarily have the truth. Like they don't have anything to offer you. So Amun Ra would probably say something like, you know, that we shouldn't be following Christianity, but he doesn't have something to supply us with. They don't have hope, but that's another conversation. So the general move of society now is toward ridding themselves of religion. Like they feel like it's enlightenment to no longer need God. Um, you probably, some of you are probably familiar with this guy. I think his name is Yoda. I want to say that's his name. Or no, that's not Young Pharaoh. Yeah, that's Yoda. He just says like the most outlandish things. And people just cheer him on, like, yeah, yeah, yes, you're right. Just because he sounds deep because he's saying things against the Bible. And like that's all you really need these days to like earn stripes or be cool is to say something that sounds um like it's part of some sort of conspiracy and if it's against jesus you're good to go so this is kind of what we're up against and i really do have a passion for youth although i have a passion for anybody um even though my ministry is focused on um afro descendants uh, i also try to tailor messages to people who are not necessarily afro descended because i don't want to breathe this you know exclusivity um but i was a public high school teacher for about three years and it was the best thing, the best time I've ever had. Like I loved it. Um, so I do have a passion for the youth and I find that these conversations are arising, especially in the high school classrooms. Um, we're having these conversations about Christianity and its origins. So African-American Christians are attacked particularly because of the history of slavery and quote unquote Christianity in the United States. And Christianity here is presented in, in quotations because well, the Bible has so much to say about our conduct and our behavior that one wonders if you can really call yourself a Christian if you're going contrary to everything the book says, right? Um, so here's some a popular meme. Um, it says, we lived like this, starting from the top. We lived in Africa like this. Then when these people came showing religious people and gave us this being the Bible, which ultimately led to slavery, and after 400 years of slavery led to prison chain gangs. And after church for enjoyment, they apparently lynched and burned people, which caused black people to fight and get um, hosed down basically, all of this so that we can live in poverty. And after all that, they still pray like this to a white man that started all of their problems and looks like this. So they blame every ounce of oppression. It's always Jesus' fault. And can you always hear this thing about this white Jesus? I didn't necessarily um, intend to make that part of the conversation, but I do think that the portrayal, the common portrayal that we've had of Jesus, it isn't accurate. But like I said, that's not the focus of the conversation right now. Then we have people saying, Jesus was invented to keep black people from beating white people up. Like, so like, you think in your mind <laughs> that they could have invented all of the spiritual intricacies, all of the prophecies, all of the accurate things in the word, the way it harmonizes from beginning to end, and the fact that so many different people contributed to it. You believe that they made it up just so that we would be docile. But the truth is so far from that. And I actually grew up, not grew up believing that, but during that period when I was, um, when I told you guys I left Christianity for a while, I actually believed that. Like I believed that Christianity was a, a made up religion that was intended to keep um, people oppressed and docile. You know, they say that Christianity was forced onto our ancestors, that they beat it into us. And, and nine times out of 10, if you ask somebody who hasn't studied this, that's what they're going to believe because we've heard it so many times. We've heard that Christianity was forced on us through slavery. That's just not the case. Now, now I forgot. Um, I just remembered an element that I would have liked to have included. I'm just going to mention it. Um, that Christianity was in Africa for centuries before slavery. Um, many of us who are here as a result of slavery or throughout the Caribbean as a result of slavery um, may not have been Christian, but there was Christianity on the West and Central Coast of Africa. Um, and uh, I'd like to discuss that with you guys later if you want, but the point still is, nevertheless, we're going to explore some, some facts, some pieces of evidence. I'm very evidence-driven, 
my career that I do outside of apologetics. I'm an attorney, um, have a bachelor's degree in history. I'm very passionate about, you know, presenting facts. Like that's what we want. We want the truth. And so the truth is supported by evidence, right? So let's take a, let's take a look at the evidence of the slave master's resistance, not his resistance, you know, not for him to force Christianity upon us, but to keep us from Christianity. So I'm gonna show you guys maybe two or three, I don't remember how many I put in here, um, but there's scores of them. Um, two or three pieces of slave narratives uh, about their experience with their masters. I hate that word master, but their experience with their masters as it relates to them trying to attend church or find a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So this was written by a man named Tom. There is a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was really popular around the same time that Tom Jones wrote his book. Um, it's not the same work though. He just called it by the same title because he was trying to ride the wave of popularity. The other book is a work of fiction written by an abolitionist. Um, an abolitionist is someone who fights against slavery. So she tried to tell a tale that would arouse people's feelings of, of you know, compassion against slavery. So I don't want you guys to get the works confused, but this is a, this is a firsthand account of an, an individual who experienced this. So he says, he said, he being the master, did not tell you I would whip you if you went nigh these means, and did not tell you to stop this foolish praying? I told him he did. And if he would, why, he might whip me, but still I could not stop praying because I wanted to be good, that I might be happy and go to heaven. So here's a few phrases that we don't use anymore, a few um, terms that we don't use the same way. Meetings, when you see that in the slave narratives, that refers to church meetings. Um, be good means to be accepted by the Holy Spirit, like to have a relationship with God. Being happy is to have this exhilarating, joyful um, religious experience. So he wants to be good. He wants to be a good person and he wants to be accepted by the Lord and have this exhilarating experience and to go to heaven. He ordered me to strip off my clothes. And as I did, he took down the cowhide, heavy and stiff with blood, which he had before drawn from my body with that cruel weapon and which was congealed upon it. He then whipped me with great severity, inflicting terrible pain at every blow upon my quivering body, which was still very tender from recent lacerations. My suffering was so great that it seemed to me that I should die. When I first started reading slave narratives, I, I believe this was one of the ones that I came across that brought me to tears. Because like I said, I had this myth in my head. I had this myth in my head that they forced Christianity on us. And it just didn't sit right with me because I don't know, it just, I would say the Holy Spirit, this didn't sit right with me. So I went to investigate it. And when I started finding stuff like, he told me to stop going to church and I didn't listen. So he kept whipping me. I cried. First of all, I'm crying because the pain that he endured. I'm crying because so many people are leaving Christianity and using this as an excuse to do so. Right? People are leaving after being fed misinformation. So let's talk about another piece of evidence. This is a book called Slave Testimony. It's a really thick book. Um, on Amazon, it's expensive, but they have them like on half or some of them knockoff website where it's like four or five bucks. I highly recommend it. Um, here's an excerpt. And it's filled with it's filled with letters and interviews and speeches from the first person, like from people who actually lived through slavery. It says, I knew a man who would let his slaves carry on a meeting for a while, but when they got a little happy, the overseer would come and whip them. I have known him to whip a woman with 400 lasses because she said she was happy. This was to scare the religion out of them because he thought he wouldn't be able to get anything out of them if they were religious. He said he would rather see them stealing and swearing and whoring than be religious. Such things are common. There are cases that are much worse than these. So the slave master's mentality was not let me force them to believe in Jesus. The slave master's mentality was I want to keep them as far away from religion as possible. And this really, this conversation, I'm, I'm shrinking it down because of time. Um, but there's just so much evidence, so much compelling evidence that the actual reality, the truth behind this conversation is that they did not want us to be Christians because... European American speaks on why slave masters feared letting their slaves become Christians. And um, on page 76 of this work, it says, they think that they shall lose respect and authority. The change will certainly inflict their servants, 
foster a spirit of equality and disobedience. And in the end, be that's a typo, productive of no good. So their mindset was like, if we tell them that they're children of the Most High God, just like we are, they're going to find themselves thinking that they're equal with us. And that doesn't, that's not conducive to servitude. That's not conducive to keeping them in their place. So we don't want them to think that, um, you know, the Heavenly Father is their father as well. And I have evidence or another piece of a narrative where the slave master verbatim says this. He says, you must not teach them to pray or that they have any other master except for me, because I'm the one they have to answer to. Um, so again, this idea that they forced us to be Christians, it's just, it's false. So now the question then becomes, if you're going to be woke, right? And woke, it's defined, it's defined, they're like variables, um, vari variations in the definition. But the way I define it, and I think a commonly acceptable one, would be um, to be aware, to be awake, right? To be aware of the tools of injustices that are used, the tools of injustice that are used to keep people oppressed. To be aware of the tools of injustice that are used to keep people oppressed. That's what being woke is. But beyond that, it's supposed to also include this assumption that you care. Not just that you're aware, but that you're driven by that towards some action to rectify it. Um, so does the Bible, does the God of the Bible care about injustice? In other words, how can a Christian be woke? And my answer to that is you really can't be woke if you're not a Christian. Um, a lot of people are trying to rewrite history to pretend that, for example, the ancient Egyptians or the people of West Africa did not actually believe in deities. They didn't actually worship gods. They just were representations of nature. There's no such thing as spirits because they're atheists. So now they're trying to make our ancestors atheists, but that's just not the case. Like, so there's always been an element of, an element of spiritual understanding, but today that's not the case. And so I find that if you call yourself aware of the tools of injustice that are used to keep people oppressed and you're turning a blind eye to spiritual oppression, you're missing the entire point. Like we go through things not just because men aren't just greedy just because, it's because an enemy has sown tears into their heart, right? And so if we're not aware of that, we're fighting against the wind. You, you really can't be woke if you're not a Christian because only in the Bible do we find not only the root cause of all of these issues, but also the solution, which is Jesus Christ. So first of all, for slavery, slavery is forbidden. <laughs> the way the United States and the new world practice slavery is forbidden in the Bible. So again, we go back to this idea of how can you call yourself Christian if everything you're doing is contrary to the word of God? So Exodus 21, 16 is our Old Testament verse. This is from the English Standard Version. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him, it's, it's the death penalty. You're going to die. Like God, like God is not playing about you stealing people. So that's the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, for people who are like, the Old Testament doesn't count anymore. 1 Timothy um, 1, starting from verse 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers. Now listen to this list. Let's pay attention to this list. For those who strike their fathers and their mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So homosexuality, which everybody knows is a sin, right? We don't, nobody ever, that's not true. People do have that argument that it's not a sin. I mean, but for the most part, we understand that homosexuality is a sin, that lying, that perjuring, that being sexually promiscuous, murdering. And right in there, we have people who enslave others. God has never been it has never been pro-slavery, especially not the way it's been practiced in the United States. Now, the Old Testament Jews, the Bible does lay down parameters for servitude. Um, but, and of course, I don't have the time to go into that. But it is not to be compared with what the United States and the countries around about experienced in the, um, during the transatlantic slave trade. So here are a few verses. And I'm going to go through them really quickly. So feel free to screenshot this if you want. Because um, I don't, you know, like I said, we don't have a lot of time. But. Okay, so Isaiah 117, learn to do well, seek judgment or justice, 
relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. I'm going to just stop right there for a second because a lot of times when we go over these verses, we see these verses in the Bible, we immediately spiritualize them. Yes, do well. Relieve the spiritually oppressed. No, yes, we should relieve the spiritually oppressed. That's the whole point of the gospel, right? But also when Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't just, all right, let me give you an example. When Jesus was talking, when Jesus was talking to his disciples once, they offered him food or said something about him being hungry. And he says, I have meat that you know not of. In other words, I have food that I, that I am filled with that you know nothing about. And we understand that to mean spiritual food, the work of him that sent him, right? He was fulfilled by relying on God and doing the work that God had for him, right? But that also didn't stop Jesus from feeding 5,000. He didn't tell them just be filled with the Holy Spirit. He took care of their temporal needs, right? So the Bible says, if you tell somebody, I wish you to be warm, I pray for you to be warm, and you don't offer them something to warm them, or you don't give them food for their belly, but you're telling them be full, their words are in vain. And that's in the same chapter where it says for faith without works is dead. So we have to live out our faith. It's not enough to just be woke in the context of understanding, but woke also in the context of being moved to compassion to work for relieving the oppressed physically, like physically. But somehow we've come to like bifurcate. We've separated um, spiritual, the spiritual aspect of human beings from their physical life. So people come to church, um, and we, you know, we pray with them. We hope that they get better in their situations and their circumstances. But we've kind of lost, for the most part, I'm not talking about your church, I'm just speaking in general, in Christianity, not even within Adventism. We've kind of lost this understanding that that's still a human being. Like, they're going to leave here and they're going to go back to whatever their circumstances, whether they don't have food in their fridge or electricity or a friend, whether they're going through mental health crises they're still going to have to go through that. Like we should be catering to the whole person instead of separating the person from their spiritual life, right? So the Bible talks so much about being fair, caring about your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. We have the parable of the Good Samaritan. We have so much evidence that God is telling us, don't just speak to people, do for them, right? So Psalms 10, 18, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth be no more oppressed. Jeremiah 22, 3, thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness and to deliver, deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. The spoiled means somebody who has been robbed. You think of like going to war and getting the spoils. Deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, that's the immigrant, the fatherless nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. Micah 6, 8, we know this one, right? He has showed the old man what is good. And what did the Lord require of thee but to do justly, love mercy, mer love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God? Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. This is one of my favorites as well. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth. And in other versions, that, ver that word dumb means, it doesn't mean intellectually dumb. It means um, unable, to, unable to speak. So like we call people who can't speak, we call them mutes now. Um, but it was dumb then. So he's basically saying, speak up for the voiceless. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Not just bring them a hot plate once a week. Plead, a plead their cause, right? Psalms 82.3, defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Um, 1 John 3.17-18, whoso has this world's good and sees his brother who has a need and shuts up his bowel of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? In other words, if you have enough to give, and we know as SDAs that we're called to even sacrificial giving, um, if we have enough to give and we see somebody without and we harden our hearts and turn away from them, how are you going to say you love God? How are you going to say the love of God is dwelling within you? That's what that verse is saying. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Does God care about injustice? He absolutely does. So how can a Christian be woke? We're woke because our God is woke. We're woke because Jesus himself set the parameters of what it means to be a good neighbor, to care about those who are suffering and going through oppression. Um, you guys can read this later. This is Isaiah uh, 58, 6 through 12, where God is basically saying that what he really wants is for us to have compassion one for another. And he values this more than really like what we call fasting and doing all of these rites and ceremonies. So 
now we're going to go in a little bit more deep, like a little bit more pointed. So I started talking about Christianity in general. I started talking about Christianity and being woke. How about being Christian black woke in the SDA church? So obviously she's not SDA, but like whatever, right? Um, I was I was brought up in a very conservative um, local church. I loved it, but it was super conservative. And, you know, I try to find the right words to say this, but but basically entertainment was very heavily guarded, praise God. Um, behavior, conduct, in, a, in many ways, that's the Adventism that I came to know. That's the Adventism that I was baptized into, was one that was guarded not just in, uh, you know, on Sabbath or in church or in religious matters, things that we in our minds somehow dedicate specifically to God, but in every aspect of life, in diet, in dress, in attitude, in money, finances, in interaction with business, in school, everything we consider God. That, that's that's one of the appeals, I believe, of Christianity if it's practiced properly, but specifically of Adventism. So even within that conservative, very nice, warm, loving environment that I was brought up in, I was also brought up with a, couple, with a few things that I think is maybe extremism or just maybe... Uh, Ignorance, lack of knowledge, right? One of those things is that they really quieted my passions against injustice. Like they really quieted my zeal for seeing things done right. In other words, for justice, for relieving the oppressed. Because for some reason we have this unspoken rule and sometimes it's very loudly spoken. that these are secular issues and that God doesn't care about that. So the same way the world is saying, how are you going to be Christian and woke? We got the church saying, you're going to be woke and Christian. We have the church saying Jesus is coming soon. Focus just on that. As though somehow me loving my neighbor is in conflict with me preparing for the second coming of Christ. Like, but that's the message that was given to me. That's my experience. And so for a while, because I didn't know anything about, you know, I grew up Catholic. We don't really we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus like that. We don't study the Bible like that. So Becoming a Seventh-day Adventist was my first interaction to like a deep study and a deep intimacy with the word of God. And I'm being raised up under all these people who obviously were walking far longer than I have. They know about this. What do I know? So basically it was like their word was rule for me. If they say that's not what God wants, then who am I to argue against that? And I'm just going to listen to them because you know what they're talking about, right? And I don't want to displease God. I'm new to this and I'm trying to make sure I walk properly. But I always had this, again, this nagging feeling, this like inkling in the, in, in the bottom of my heart. Like, although I could control my outward expression of whether or not I pursue certain avenues of justice or whether I study certain things or pay attention to certain things, I couldn't control the fact that injustice bothers me. So what I did, I started studying the Bible. And that's how I came across all of these verses. And there's so many, I could do an hour and I could probably do two hours of just talking about the Bible and the things that the Bible talks about with injustice. Like, it's serious. Um, so that was one thing that really helped me to realize that this, this pain that I feel when I see others being um, being ostracized or being mistreated, that pain came from God because that's how he feels. But I had other church members who didn't really understand that telling me that it was wrong. And I'm here tonight to tell you that that's not wrong. It's not wrong to care about the circumstances of your neighbor. That's not wrong. That's, so. I think some people may not have been familiarized with the history of Adventism and being what we now call woke. So I'm just going to drop a couple of things on y'all real quick. Wokeness in the SDA church. This is going to be a long one, but bear with me. This comes from uh, Testimonies Volume 1. There are a few in the ranks of Sabbath keepers who sympathize with the slaveholder. When they embraced the truth, they did not leave behind them all the errors they should have left. They need a more thorough draft from the cleansing fountain of truth. A draft is like a drink. So they need to drink more from the cleansing fountain of youth, of truth, excuse me. Why? Because they're sympathizing with slaveholders. Some have brought along with them their old political prejudices, which are not in harmony with the principles of the truth. They maintain that the slave is the property of the master and should not be taken from him. They rank these slaves as cattle and say that it is wronging the owner just as much to deprive him of his slaves as to take away his cattle. 
I was shown that it mattered not how much the master had paid for the human flesh and the souls of men. God gives him no title to human souls and he has no right to hold them as property. So here it is, SBA, this is, you know, Spirit of Prophecy, 1800s, rebuking the slave master for owning a slave. Let's continue. Christ died for the whole human family, whether white or black. God has made man a free moral agent, whether white or black. The institution of slavery does away with this and permits man to exercise over his fellow man a power which God never granted him and which belongs alone to God. The slave master has dared assume the responsibility of God over his slave. And accordingly, he will be accountable for the sins, ignorance, and vice of the slave. He will be called to account for the power which he exercises over the slave. The colored race, black folk, are God's property. Their maker alone is their master. And those who have dared chain down the body and the soul of the slave to keep him in degradation like the brutes will have their retribution. The wrath of God has slumbered, but it will awake and be poured out without mixture of mercy. Um, some have been so indiscreet as to talk about their pro-slavery principles, principles which are not heaven born, but proceed from the dominion of Satan. These restless spirits talk and act in a manner to bring a reproach upon the, upon, upon the cause of God. So clearly, clearly, this is Adventism, and I, you know, I'm just putting it under that umbrella, the SDA church, having the position Back when everybody thought slavery was okay and it's popping and God put Europeans in the position to own Africans and all this other stuff, when that was the dominant theme of the conversation, here we have this minor voice saying no. Now, the Quakers were another group that were actually really um, abolitionist led. But we have Adventists saying uh, no, like God does not see whites as better than blacks or blacks as better than whites. He put all of us on equal footing. It says he's made all of us free moral agents, whether white or black. And she's saying that the wrath of God is going to come upon this country because of slavery. So how can you be woke and be Seventh-day Adventist? Because we built, we're built for this. Because we understand the principles of what the Bible is saying in terms of individuality and the fact that no man can own another man. Again, Exodus 21, 16, you can't be stealing people. And even if you're not the one who physically stole him, you knew that he was stolen. He was found in your possession. You two are worthy of death. That's according to the Holy Spirit. Um, here's another portion from early writings, also written in the 1800s. These professed Christians read of the sufferings of the martyrs and tears course down their cheeks. They wonder that men could ever become so hardened as to practice such cruelty for their fellow men, which, you know, reading about the dark ages and people being burned at the stake, yeah, it'll make you cry. It's really, it's really moving. Yet, those who think and speak thus are at the same time holding human beings in slavery. Come on. And this is not all. They sever the ties of nature and cruelly oppress their fellow men. They can inflict the most inhuman torture with the same relentless cruelty manifested by papists and heathen toward Christ's followers. So now she's saying she saw an angel. And this is what they spoke to her. Give me a moment. <clears throat> Said the angel, it will be more tolerable for the heathen and for papists in the day of the execution of God's judgment than for such men. The cries of the oppressed, she's speaking specifically about Africans in America being enslaved and oppressed. The cries of the oppressed have reached unto heaven and angels stand amazed at the untold agonizing sufferings which man formed in the image of his maker causes his fellow men. Said the angel, the names of the oppressors are written in blood crossed with stripes and flooded with agonizing, burning tears of suffering. God's anger will not cease until he has caused this land of light to drink the dregs of the cup of his fury, until he has rewarded unto Babylon double. Reward her even as she has rewarded you. Double unto her, double according to her works, in the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. So again, this is clear that 
the sentiment towards oppression, the sentiment toward, of course, at the time, the issue dominating the country was slavery. But it's oppression nonetheless. You know how Jesus says, you know how Jesus says, to look at a woman with less is to commit adultery. It's not just the very act, it's the sentiment. So harboring a heart, or having a heart that harbors prejudices and racism and, and, and just undue anger toward your neighbor is oppression. And clearly God is marking these things. And he's not just going to let them go without, of course, if they're repentant. But the Bible says he shows mercy to thousands, but he will by no means excuse the guilty. So he shows mercy to the repentant, but the guilty you're still going to get their reward, double. And again, papists, for it to be worse than papists. So she starts off by saying that these, you know, martyrs, and it's really sad what happens to the martyrs, and who did it? The heathens and the papists, or the popes, right? The heathens and the popes martyred God's children. It will be more tolerable for the people who put Christians on the stake than it will be for those who kept Africans in chains, according to the spirit of prophecy. Uh, this is the last quote I have, and, I, and then I have one more slide after this, and, and I'll be done. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This is talking about laws. It says the bad have been increasing. And yet, and we are yet to be brought into straight places. But God will sustain his people in being firm and living up to the principles of his word. When the laws of men conflict with the word and law of God, we are to obey the latter. We are to obey the law of God, whatever the consequences may be. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man. God is the rightful master. And man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim as his own. Now, imagine if Sister White was alive and said some stuff like this today. She, so for, for context, she's talking about the Fugitive Slave Act, which was passed because, as we know, we've kind of been taught, slaves were running from the South to the North to become free because there were free states in the North. So once you get to the North, you don't have to worry about slavery. Then they came up with the Fugitive Slave Act, which said, well, if they came from the South and they went to the North, they're really from the South, so we can send slave catchers up there to go get them. And people will turn them in and deliver them back to the South to go back into to their master's or their owner's possession. And Sister White is saying, um, no, we're not going to participate in that. So basically, she's saying, violate this law. But she's telling them to violate a law because it's unjust and it's oppressive to other people. So this is an article, uh, this is another screenshot you may want to, um, to take. This is the last slide. Um, I'm just gonna read the first paragraph. It says, the second advent movement was inseparable from the abolitionist call for the immediate and total destruction of slavery and demand for equal rights for the oppressed. From the rise of the Millerite movement until in the, er, excuse me, in the early 1830s, through the end of the civil war, Adventists of all varieties use the tactic of moral suasion to warn pro-slavery Americans that God would soon return and judge them if they did not immediately repent and reform. In this manner, they made protests against racial injustice inseparable from their Adventist faith. Though many Adventists avoided association with political parties because they supported slavery, beginning in 1840, a significant number joined the Liberty Party, which had a single platform, the immediate and total abolition of slavery and the restoration of equality and rights among men. In 1848, the Liberty Party nominated Jared Smith, a prominent abolitionist, Millerite Adventist, and Seventh-day Sabbath observer as candidate for president of the United States. Throughout the entire antebellum period, meaning pre-Civil right, um, civil War, Millerites and Seventh-day Adventists also risked their lives to liberate slaves from bondage. While some did this legally by purchasing slaves' freedom, many broke federal law by assisting fugitives on the Underground Railroad. They upheld God's fugitive slave law in Deuteronomy 23, 15, and 16, thou shalt not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto thee. He shall dwell with thee, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of thy gates, where it liketh him best. Thou shalt not oppress him. Indeed, in all of these ways and more, Adventists were inspired by their Christian faith to fight against 
systemic racism in America. And that's my presentation. Amen. Thank you, Sister Nafi. You just dropped a whole lot of information there. And it's it's interesting that we just have such a rich history, not just being um, Black, but also being Adventist. And it, they are together. It's not something that we separate. They are merged. Um, and I really enjoyed what you said about being woke is essentially um, being aware of what is truth and also executing what is truth as well. Um, and it's like a very nice history lesson that we got as well. Um, so at this moment, we're going to go into questions. Um, feel free to raise your hand on the on the platform if you know how to, or um, just unmute yourself so you can ask your question, or you can just type it into the chat. So feel free to do that at this time. Good evening, sis. Um, I just wanted to know if you want to tell us a little bit more about Sister White and the work her son did um, in educating black folks, the boat he bought, and um, tell us a little bit more about that. I'm sorry, I didn't, can you repeat the question? <clears throat> Sister, White, Sister White's son, the work that he did, educating black folks and the boat that he bought and went down south to educate black folks. Tell us a little bit more about that also. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I told you guys, like I was kind of silenced for a while and so I started studying the Bible, but then of course I'm SDA, so I'm studying the spirit of prophecy. And I come across this book called The Southern Word. And I highly recommend everybody to read it. I highly recommend everybody to read this book of The Southern Word because in it, he just goes into such detail about not just having compassion, but again, taking action and using wisdom for, um, bringing enlightenment in terms of the spiritual truth, but also taking care of the whole man of the African-American. And so her son was obviously as well an abolitionist, but he was also a minister unto the uh, what they called the colored race or the Negro race at that time. And he did a lot of, of very tactful and yet very passionate work that exposed a lot of us to the truth and gave us the truth of, of the three angels message and just, you know, the gospel generally. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I highly recommend people look into that because it is a huge part of our history. Um, and it's something that gave me comfort once again in knowing that the things that I feel and what I feel God calling me to is not, it's not frivolous. And this was at a time again, where the dominant perception was that we weren't worth taking that effort and so not only was everybody feeling that way so it's, a, it's it's enough to feel differently but also to create an environment kind of like a hostility it's a risk right so it was a risk for um people like sister white or her son to try to um, preach the gospel to us and and because again at the beginning i showed you guys how they had this resistance to <clears throat> excuse me to african-americans <laughs> <clears throat> I promise I don't have the Rona. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so they they um they took a, they took offense to that, and there was a huge resistance to us being exposed to the gospel. So they had to kind of sneak and do it. They had to find ways to get the gospel to us. Um, in some cases, in other cases, it's profound because you just reading through the narrative, you find that like some of them would say things like, "Some Messiah just told me," like. The Holy Spirit was speaking directly to people because the avenues in the temporal world were closed. And so they didn't have a way to like get the gospel from people. And when that happened, God stepped in directly and spoke his message to people's hearts. It's, it's fascinating. But thank you for bringing that up. That, yeah, the Southern work. Okay, any other questions? I have a question. I'm just thinking about how I should phrase it. So as we know, like in, it ex like exploded in 2020, but everything that's been going on with like the police killings of unarmed like black men and then the, the protests that follow. And we had a couple of AY programs and there were a lot of like differing opinions on how we as black Christians should react to that. And a lot of people use Christ as an example and kind of make it seem like, Christ was kind of a pushover in a sense that like he didn't stand up for things like this or that he didn't like defend people in a, in a tough and strong way. So how would you 
figuring out how to phrase this, but just how would you speak to that, that specific area about if we're using Christ as an example, the way that he reacted to things like, you know, when he brings up the scripture, when Christ talks about um, if someone smites you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek, like how does that relate? Are we supposed to sit back and be walked off? walked over or like how to how do we stand up as black people but also remain in our christian character um i think that's an excellent question that is a rebuttal that we often find um for the most part i think i think as adventists we should and i use a big should we should have a better approach to this than most other christians because most other christians sever the old testament from the new testament So like they see them as two different books, but Adventists know that the Old Testament and the New Testament are really just one testament about God, right? Like there's one gospel pre-Christ and post-Christ. So um, Hebrews, no, I want to say 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that the angel of the Lord that was leading the Israelites through the desert was Jesus, right? So we know that it's the same God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When Christ was born as a man, he came on this earth with a specific purpose. And the Jews had misinterpreted, they had misinterpreted the prophecies, right? So they were expecting him to come and undo physical oppression. They were expecting him to, they were basically expecting the, the second coming. We know like in Daniel, the rock comes and hits at the feet and all of the earth's kingdoms fall and then Christ sets up his kingdom. And that's kind of what they were anticipating at that time, but they obviously were wrong. And so you see the Jews throughout Christ's walk, trying to institute him as their secular king. They're trying to get him to do certain things that were not in harmony with what he came to do, which is die for us, to be a sacrifice for us, right? So, but does Christ's mission to come and be a sacrifice for us negate everything that the Bible talks about? (laughs) Excuse me, I'm sorry, it's funny to me. Um, Does it negate everything that the Bible talks about and mentions when it comes to oppression? When it comes to immigration, when it comes to fatherlessness and widows and orphans, what the Bible says that true, pure religion and undefiled is to care for the fatherless and the widow. That's pure religion is to care for other people who are who are in a what we call underprivileged situation. So I don't see those two things being in conflict with each other. I think it would have been a distraction from Christ's mission to offer himself as a sacrifice if he had allowed them to institute that institute himself or yeah if he had allowed them to institute him as their temporal king because that's not what he came for but he will come for a time at a time to be our king right so I don't think necessarily that because that was his mission that means that what he said about oppression and what he said about loving your neighbor and even what I was mentioning before in James chapter two if you see somebody hungry and you don't fill them right All of those things are principles that are alive and well in the word of God. And they're written for us upon whom the ends of the world are come, right? So that's my general answer. My specific answer for individuals is you have to like have that relationship with God where you allow him to lead you as into whatever path he's going to have you walk as it relates to fighting against injustice. Let me say something. If it wasn't for politically active Christians, we would still be in chains. People always talk about how Christianity was used to justify slavery. Christianity is what brought about abolition. It was reading the Bible, seeing each other as equal, seeing how God feels about oppression. A lot of the verses that we went over today are what abolitionists used. And so it's just it's just that mentality, right? Because you're talking about like 2020 George Floyd and all this other stuff, right? Like if 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 we took that position that Jesus is coming soon. We can't be bothered with all that. If they had taken that position 150 years ago, when we know they had this passion about Jesus coming soon, there was a whole Advent movement surrounding it. Imagine people who had recently, right, sold their houses and their lands and really believed that Jesus was coming in their lifetime, went through the great disappointment. And then in the midst of all that, they still fighting for abolition for people that that don't even look like that. They're not even the ones going through it. They're Europeans. They're free. They ain't got nothing to worry about. They're spending their time and energy trying to liberate somebody else while still knowing that Christ is coming soon. So I don't think the fact that, you know, Jesus did this on the earth or the fact that Jesus is coming soon is in conflict with fighting against oppression. It's carrying out, loving your neighbor as yourself. One of the two great commandments. Um, Now, when it comes to turning the other cheek, I think that's a personal, that's a personal thing. So like, 
I personally, we're, we're supposed to take, we're supposed to be able to withstand attacks, right? It doesn't mean necessarily let people walk all over you, but it does mean you're going to tolerate a certain level of disrespect. Like it's just, it's just part of being a Christian, right? So on a personal level, there are things that God is calling us to endure. But when we see what the Bible is talking about for others, we don't tolerate it for others. So there's certain things I'm going to let you try me, but I'm not going to let you try somebody else with in my presence because that's what loving your neighbor like yourself is. That is what standing up for the voiceless, being a voice for the voiceless is, um, Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. So I know that was a little, but that's kind of how I see it. Thank you. Um, there is a question, um, and it's on the same vein on fighting um, social um, injustices. Um, in regards to your thoughts on Black Lives Matters, yeah, Black Lives Matter, and um, how um, we should be a part, if we should, if we shouldn't, on um, as we are Adventists, what is, what should be our stance on it? So, <clears throat> I used to love that phrase, Black Lives Matter. I, because I believe Black Lives Matter, yeah. like yeah, we matter, right? That's a really straightforward, you know, like how are you gonna argue against that? People do it. But, but you shouldn't. So, but I was led by the spirit of God to investigate this group, Black Lives Matter, and their origins. And I did a video on it on YouTube. And baby, I don't even say Black Lives Matter no more. What? I'm not even, don't associate me with these folks at all. They are straight up witches. Like, and I know like, if you hear that from like, an older European American or like an older Christian who's not really woke, you're gonna feel like they're hating. Like, oh, you just saying they witches because you don't want us to care about. No, like they legit, like they start their um protest with a seance. Like I have video of them saying this. And I wasn't paying attention because I did go to one protest last year. Yeah, one. I wasn't paying attention, but after I started researching, I thought back <clears throat> and I started remembering some of the things that they were doing. And so they said, like, when you're in the crowd and they call out somebody's name in the crowd, say his name, George Floyd, say his name. They're trying to call George Floyd. Like, this is what they said. They're calling the presence of George Floyd to come help them with the fight. Oh, no, baby, we don't do that. So, <laughs> so there, that doesn't mean that we can't fight, right? But we do need to be careful with who we affiliate ourselves with. You will never catch me out of the Black Lives Matter protest. Not, not intentionally. Maybe if I'm walking down the street in the crowd. But I will never. Because, you know, again, I grew up in Ifa. I know that these spirits are real. Some people have the benefit of ignorance to think that demons don't exist. I don't have that. I don't have that pleasure. I know they exist. So I'm not going to be around here while y'all calling on all them demons and expecting Jesus to walk. No, I'm not participating in that. Um, so, but we do have groups that, are Christian. We do have Adventist groups even. Um, I'm really cool with uh, Tiffany Llewellyn, who um, is the founder of Adventist for Social Justice. I myself founded an, um, an organization post-Floyd, like two days after he died, um, Lift Every Voice Coalition for Justice. So, you know, there's people out there that are doing it, um, but Black Lives Matter, they just, it's just not it. Um, they just not where it's at. I don't think God would have us it's one thing to associate with secular, right? And we have to be careful with that. And if you read, for example, about Adventists and Sister White's um, position on joining with people during the prohibition, which is like when they were trying to ban liquor and alcohol from the United States, she they called it the temperance movement. <clears throat> so you can search through the database for temperance movement. And she was saying the same thing, like we have to be very selective in who we affiliate with. Even certain Christian groups, she was like, I don't know about them. But ones that like, um, modeled principles of piety, of modesty, people who weren't, you know, being too out there. She was like, let's work specifically with them. Even though they're not Adventists, but they have principles of righteousness, we can work with them. And, you know, they did. So it's not that we can't work with everybody, but we do have to be like circumspect about what we're doing. And Black Lives Matter, be not on the list, baby. They didn't make good. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other question? comment. I'll give you 10 seconds. Um, yes, good night, sister, again. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you were disbanded from something. We would like to hear about that. And also, too, um, you know, sometimes when you try to tell people about the Bible, they say, oh, look, the Bible say obey your master and stuff like that. And they use 
Bible text about slavery, not understanding it was like people paying off debt and stuff like that. This is the true principle. So you could talk a little bit about more of that. Okay. <clears throat> so like I said, I've been on social media doing specifically apologetics, urban apologetics, talking about whole tips and Horus and Egypt and all kind of stuff for about five years. Um, and along the way, at first I thought I was like, I thought I was like non about this, a voice crying in the wilderness. But then there were other people along the way that I learned were doing the same thing. Um, and so we kind of came together and like formulated this group um, that we, we weren't really, we were a network. We weren't an official organization or anything like that. It was just like, if you're in ministry and I'm in ministry and both of our ministries are doing the same thing, we might link up or share resources or something like that, do videos together every once in a while, stuff like that. Um, when they hold conferences, I was invited to the conferences. I was invited to like participate in writing a chapter in a book with them. Um, they had like a movie coming out and a documentary. It ain't happening no more, but I was invited initially to do that. And so I didn't, I, 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 my focus, you guys saw my mission statement. My focus was, Black people understand that it's okay to be black. Like you don't have to pretend you're not black to look for Jesus to love you. And my other mission was, yeah, you can be black and love Jesus because no, Jesus didn't force you into slavery, right? So I wasn't focused necessarily on being Adventist in the online space. Now at home in my neighborhood, that's a different story. But in the online space, that was my focus. And you know, I did this under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Like I really, you know, I, I really prayed about it because I didn't want to be like betraying him because I can't stand people like people sometimes they'll say well if somebody asks me what my denomination is I just tell them I'm a Christian because I'm not going to say I'm seven day at this because it's a bad look no like if you ask me I'm telling you I'm an SDA like I'm not ashamed of being an SDA what's wrong with you um but so yeah so if anybody ever asked me directly I would answer that but I wasn't volunteering the information you know so because I didn't want it to be a distraction I'm thinking like the people that I work with, they study like the, the kind of stuff I put up on the screen tonight. That's the kind of stuff we're on. Like we we love learning the facts behind things. So I thought, you know, if they ever did find out or ask me how I was SDA, I'm not gonna have a problem with them because they will know that the rumors about SDA aren't true. It's the public that I want to like kind of keep away from all that because the public is ignorant. So and I don't have time to be distracted from my mission. So, but then recently maybe like seven months ago, you know, the Lord was talking to me. He was like, listen, it's time. And I knew the time would come eventually where I would have to be like that girl, like that SDA girl. Um, so I started like being a little bit more forward with that information. Like if somebody had a conversation, it even had a little tiny bit to do with the Sabbath. I was like, happy Sabbath child, SDA gang. You know what I'm saying? Gang, gang. Like I was being really forward with it. And so it got back to the people that I was in ministry with, like the urban apologetics community. And so I got a text one day, it was like, are you SDA? And I'm like, sure, what's up? Like, what's up? And it just started this fury of like, what do you mean you're SDA? Don't y'all believe? How they said, I forgot what they said. Ooh, don't y'all believe? It was so outlandish. And I was like, no, like, where did you get that from? Like, no, we don't believe that. You want to talk about it? I can show you what we believe. But they weren't interested in that. So they wanted me to basically renounce my Adventism. And it's like, either you, like, either you get down or lay down. Like, either you're going to renounce me as the or you can't sit with us. I'm like, who do you think you're talking to? Like, like no, like, it doesn't work like that. If you want to have a conversation, we can sit down and I can explain to you why the things you're saying, we don't even believe. Like, you have beef with me over things we don't believe for real. Like, we don't believe everybody that go to church on Sunday going to hell. Who told you that? We don't believe that. We've never believed that. Right? So... You have all this beef and all this animosity and you're trying to tell me to renounce something that I can't renounce because it's not even my position. So they were like, well, we want you to meet with the head honcho. And, you know, as a result of that meeting, we're going to decide whether you're going to be okay. And I was like, be okay? Like, what you mean? Like, what y'all going to do? Y'all like, what are you going to do? They didn't tell me what they were going to do. They were like, we don't know what's going to happen if you refuse. I was like, do it now because I'm going to refuse. Now. Like, what are you? So... They did. So they did. So they basically like I had one of my friends who was a pastor because these people are pastors. Like these are big names in the regular, you know, Christian black church. So like one of them was a pastor. He hit me up. He was like, yo, Neff, yo, it's going down. They about to like embarrass you on the internet. This, this, that, and the third. So I'm like, all right, cool. So then I made a video about the Sabbath, which I have never talked about ever. So the video came out about the Sabbath. Like I think it was like on a Friday. And then the next day, they dropped a hammer with the whole excommunication thing. So to the common man, 
it looked like they excommunicated me because I was so funny now. But the experience, legit. I laugh about it. I was laughing about it then. I laugh about it now. But the experience was really like, I could feel the, it was like feeling the presence of the devil himself tracking me down. Like, I, I, it's easy to have this conversation and give you a recap of it in two minutes, but it happened over the span of weeks. And so daily, I'm seeking the Lord, like, Lord, how would you have me approach this situation? Do you want me to sit down with these men? You know, what do I do? Right? And I'm searching the spirit of prophecy and where she talks about, you know, people saying lies. Like, they told my friends, who I thought were my friends, they told my friends that this guy told these people, yeah, I had a conversation with Neff, and I asked her specifically, does she think you're going to hell because you go to church on Sunday? And she said yes. I'm like, well, I would never, we never had that conversation, and I would never say that because I don't believe that. So they were literally spreading lies, right? And then that same dude I was telling you about my friend, he was like, so what they did was they copied, um, they all made a statement that said, Neff is SDA, and this is what SDAs believe. And there was like a list of nine things, and half of them were outlandish, right? Like, we don't believe that stuff. And um, so they were all saying, like, we can't rock with her no more. But instead of sharing the post, they all copied it and pasted it. So it looked like it originated from each person. And so my friend, he didn't share it. And then he called me. He was like, um, yeah, um, I'm sorry. You know, I think I'm a coward. But they called me and they told me, like, either I have to, like, participate with them or they're going to excommunicate me, too. Right. So like I'm hearing from. So he told me that he couldn't have my back no more. Where before he was like, well, if you go to the meeting, I'll be a witness for you. all testify on your behalf. I'm going to show you, know, talk about your character, this and that. And now he's saying, oh, I can't support you no more because they threatening me because I got a church to worry about. And if they blacklist my church, that's going to ruin my career. And all this like over me. Below me, like, what are you, why? Why is it that deep? Why are you having to sow lies? And they're calling people on Facebook that they've never even met. Oh, I see, I see you still on her friends list. We about to blacklist you too. Like putting pressure on people. And it really felt, it really felt like that same spirit of martyrdom, right? So I put a couple of memes out about Martin Luther and stuff like that. But then the next day, like the day after they posted it, <clears throat> somebody posted on Facebook, on this day in 1844, nothing happened. And they were mocking the great disappointment. But we know that the great disappointment wasn't really a disappointment because Jesus moved into the most holy place and that's when the investigative judgment began. We know that. They don't know that. And so the timing of it, the fact that God was the one that pushed me to start talking about it more, right? And then for, it, the, for the timing of it to come, I'm getting chills now, for the timing of it to come and coincide with the anniversary of the beginning of the investigative judgment, I knew that the Holy Spirit was the one behind all of that. Like he orchestrated all of that. So I don't really worry about it. I don't really worry about it anymore, but yeah, that's that's kind of how it went down. And now, now, now every Tuesday, so I reached out to Dwayne Lemon and Ivor Myers. And I was like, listen, these are some big names in their church. I'm gonna need some big names in my church. And we like do some rebuttals to what they're saying. I didn't know these men before that. Like I just reached out to them. And then we've been doing videos every Tuesday and we do a private study on Mondays since October. Um, so we've done like 18 sessions now because they wanted to pick on me. but. I know that it didn't really have to do with me. It was the Holy Spirit bringing about the message to a, you know, a loud, I'm not going to call it the loud cry, but it's to a louder extent because time is like cutting short. Like we don't really have as much time as we like to think we do. Um, and so I feel like now where people never heard of Adventism, there were so many phone calls and messages. People were really, and still are watching this stuff. Like I'm getting messages almost daily from people saying, I've never heard any of this doctrine before. This is crazy. And I've joined the Monday night. These people like people who were my friends before all of this and haven't been speaking to me because they're afraid or whatever. But nevertheless, they're silently watching. And I believe that's kind of God's orchestration. Like he wants the truth to get to people who otherwise would have never had it. So that was that. I kind of forgot what your second question was. I know you had two. I hope I get credit for that, but I forgot what the second one was. Yeah, I forgot the second one too. Roy, it's in, okay, it's in the Bible to um Oh yeah, that's right. I got you. So again, that could be a whole presentation by itself, but the Bible has parameters for engaging in what <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> okay, what has been translated under the same word slavery. But it's really not it's not slavery, it is bondage. And it's servitude, but it's 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 like a debt peonage. So basically, 
if you had a debt that you owed and you couldn't pay, you could work it off. That's basically what it was. Um, it's a lot more intricate than that. Um, you know, some people say there's a verse in Leviticus, I want to say, where it says, if you strike your servant and he doesn't die, but he's out for like two or three days, you don't have to get punished because he's your property. And people use that verse to say, see, the Bible says you can beat those slaves. No. So the verse before that said, if you, if you strike your servant and he loses an eye, you have to let him go. Or if you kill him, you're going to get killed. Or if he loses a tooth, you have to let him go. But if you knock him out for a couple of days and he's all right, he just gets back up. You don't have to let him go because you've lost two days worth of labor. So that's your punishment. That's what the Bible's saying. He didn't say, oh, it's okay to beat him. Like, no. So this is one of those things where it's like, we have to we have to be contextually in the verse and in the passages to understand what was going on. But the whole plan of the whole, um, I call it the plan of redemption, the whole um, system of servitude in the Bible was a type of a plan of redemption because people had debts that they could not pay. And so there was a system, you know, allowed that allowed for them to work that debt off. And then they had a cutoff. So like for those of us who are like credit savvy, because not everybody's on that, like get your credit score up, whatever, you know that after seven years, a debt falls off of your credit report. They can't count that against you no more. They got that from the Bible. Every seven years, all debts were cleared. And now you start over at square one, you're no longer in debt. So this is an institution that God put in place so that people would not be in a perpetual state of economic servitude. So God cares about economic oppression. Um, and yeah, so I would highly encourage people to study what the Bible is actually saying, even in the New Testament, where it says, for example, servants obey your masters, right? They don't keep going like two verses down. It says, and you masters, mm -hmm, you masters respect your servants also, knowing that you both answer to one God. They always leave that part out, though, because that's what the slave master did. They left that part out because they didn't want that conviction. He just told you to be okay to them. But they didn't tell you the part where the Bible says for them not to whoop you. But, you know, that's a conversation for another day. Thank you. Um, I, I, have a, I have a question from a young person. If you mind sharing us where you got your name, Nefrenity. Okay, yeah. Um, so... It is, um, okay, so never is Egyptian for beautiful, and nitty is short for impunity, which means exemption from harm or punishment. So my uh, interpretation of that is beautiful freedom, because if I'm exempt from punishment, I'm free, right? Um, so I told you guys I was a hotel. Like, I was a, I was a hotel, you hear me? Like, I got a punk tattoo, you know, like a little cross with the loop at the top. I got that tattoo, like, I believe Jesus was the white man's religion. I was telling everybody, like, you know, that's the white man's religion. You know, Jesus is, I was telling everybody that nonsense. Like, I was heavy into it. Um, so, yeah, so that's where my name came from. I didn't necessarily see the need to read myself. It's just a word. Nefer is just a word. It means beautiful. The English language we speak because we were brought here to English speaking nations, you know. So the words that we speak now is just a condition of, it's just a result of the conditions that we find ourselves in. But if we were back in Africa, we'd be speaking something else. So I don't, I don't take issue with using an Egyptian word. I'm not a hotep. It's just, it's just an African word that means beautiful. But thank you for asking because I love talking about money. All right. I think we are good. We're good with questions. Let me just check. Yeah, we're good with questions. Great, great on time as well. And I just want to say again, thank you, Sister Nephi, for being with us today. Um, starting off the Sabbath really, really well. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to come again and dissect some more history lessons with us on um, being a Black Christian, um, especially when we need to know our identity, identity and knowing that our identity is rooted in Christ. But that does not compromise that we are Black as well, because God created all colors, all beautiful variations and shades, um, and we just need to embrace that. And for everyone, again, if you're interested in her content, um, she mentioned it before, um, um, just type in her name on YouTube, you'll find a, a host of things. Um, and she mentioned that she's doing these series. And I believe she, she did one with our dear friend Elder Patel too a while back. So um, there's a familiar face there. Um, and check it out because the gospel certainly is being preached um, throughout the word world and um, people are learning who God truly is. And, you know, we have to just we can be a part of the loud cry, you know what I mean? We can um, share this information with others, 
prior to the um, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I encourage us to um, share information, share what is truth, um, and be a part of calling people out of darkness, um, sharing, the, sharing these things that you know we've been hearing all the time about this is a white man's religion, that this is um, something that was forced upon us, which is totally an insult to those who um, came from, from Africa. It's a total insult because we know that the Ethiopian man, he was black and he was mentioned in the Bible. So just remember, always looking to truth and looking to the Bible for all these truths.